All right, here we go. Podcast for today, August 18th. Let's go through the, the rundown of what we're going to discuss. I'm Ronnie G, your host, Caravan the Podcast, a companion show for Caravan the TV show on Amazon Prime and now Tubi. So let's run down the, the rundown, shall we? Got a lot going on. First off, the, uh, the NAR decision, August 17th, fully in effect. A lot going on with that. We're going to look at the rental market here in Miami-Dade and then also going to look at it in the Tampa market. I want to talk a little bit about reality TV show, you know, like Million Dollar Listing. Some of these shows that, you know, the the, the real estate shows that have really good cash, really well produced. But I want to talk a little bit about it. And then um, I also want to talk a little bit about politics, what's going on. You know, the whole uh, this week we have the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Let's hope that everybody stays safe. So stay tuned. we got a great podcast coming your way. All right. Um, those flags are famous. Oh, fans. I just combined the word fans and another word that ends at AGS. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Let's talk about a couple of things. First off, before we even get into the rundown, Let's talk about the fact that Caravan, the TV show, has been doing so amazing on Amazon that Tubi, which is Fox's free streaming platform, decided that they didn't want to wait until October to release it. They wanted to release it now. I don't know, we got something like 40,000 downloads on Amazon. Um, Check back next week and I'll let you know how the performance is on Tubi, but it looks good so far. So let's, uh, let's start today. You know, I've been talking about on the show, I've been talking a lot about what's going on in the housing market in terms of sales and listings and prices. And that's for sales. People are looking to buy houses. People are looking to sell houses. Today, I want to switch it up just a little bit. We always do a comparison. Like last week, I did a comparison between Miami-Dade, Miami Beach, Beverly Hills. Uh, today, I want to stay in the state of Florida. I want to compare the rental market here in Miami and what's going on with the rental market in Tampa probably two of the largest cities in the whole state of Florida. Very, very interesting what's going on. So first of all, in Miami, we've got about 19,000 homes listed for rent, okay? Here's the interesting data that I'm seeing. Seeing a lot of price reductions, and on top of that, we're also seeing um, property staying on the market a lot longer. This is all public data. This is all data that you can see on all of you know, your, your typical websites, Zillow, Realtor.com, etc. So over 19,000 homes and condos listed for rent in Miami-Dade County. 15,000 of them, a little bit more than 15,000 of them, have been on the market for 90 days or longer. What does that tell you? It tells you that when you start to see prices come down, you're seeing apartments taking uh, and, and homes taking a long time to get out and rent, that the housing market, specifically the rental market, is not that strong and and price declines are probably going to continue. Hey, Trump or Harris? Boom, there you go. I don't know if you can see, I got Muscle Beach behind me. This is the great thing about Miami is people are always coming to Miami. That's something that we saw in the news for a really long time. We just saw in the news repeatedly over and over and over the past three or four years how rents are going up. I mean, I know myself and from people that I know that are close to me, that their rent sometimes went up a thousand. Good friend of mine, he lives in the Flamingo, the world famous Flamingo, where uh, you have the time of your life, but your money uh, might disappear. You know, you have dreams come true, but your money might disappear. He was paying about 2,800 in rent and they just raised them up to $4,000, you know, recently. But three years ago, four years ago, he was paying like 2,100 and now he's up to 4,000. Um, He didn't want to leave the building, he wanted to stay in the building, so he decided it was more beneficial for him to pay that price than to move out. What I'm seeing though, and I'm talking to a lot of other people who are savvy, who don't mind getting up and moving one building to another or, you know, moving, uh, moving houses. What I'm seeing is that they are becoming very competitive because if you're a fully qualified tenant, meaning you have provable income, good credit, track record of paying all your bills on time, paying your housing especially on time, um, those, that's what landlords want. And what I see is that when their landlords are getting crazy and they're starting to raise the rent, you know, I'm not talking about a 5% or a 10% year over year or, or, or whatever rent increase. I'm talking about a rent increase by almost $1,000, you know, like a 30% rent increase. What I'm seeing is that people are saying, nah, 
I'm a, here's what I'm going to pay. And there's 20 other apartments or homes that I could rent in this area. And if you don't want to redo the lease for this, I'm out and I'm going to go lease this other place. And that's what's happening. And that's probably why we're seeing so many um, uh, homes and apartments still listed for rent. You know, almost 75% of the market, of the rental market here that's listed for rent, again, publicly traded data, Zillow, Realtor.com, Homes.com, Apartments.com, all this is all publicly traded data. And we're seeing this data and it's pointing to the fact that 75% of the homes listed for rent in Miami-Dade are, you know, are 90 days or older. Now let's compare that to Tampa. Tampa's an interesting market. Even the little kids are getting their fit on. What a good day, man. That's the beauty of Miami. That's yeah, great. You know, I got, a, I got a good response last week on the podcast. First of all, this is great because the first week I only had, you know, like maybe 50 people total to watch it. Second week I had about 200. Last week, I don't know, we had like 2,300. Who knows what we're going to have this week. I just keep on marketing it. But, um, but everybody got good feedback because I was on Ocean Drive and they got to see other people and got to see what's going on. So I think I'm going to continue doing it on Ocean Drive on, on the weekend. It's a fun time, you know? There you go. Got a little Elvis Crespo playing at Mangoes, a little bass on me. It's the beauty of South Beach, baby. There's always something going on. We always have action. So I just discussed the whole rental market here in Miami. Just gave real broad strokes and overviews of it. Of course, an area like um, like uh, Miami Beach probably is a little bit more insulated because a lot of people live here. Brickell as well, but here's the other thing that's crazy. We're gonna have like another 10,000 units come online with all the new buildings that are being done by 2025. You put, you add another 10,000 rental units on online here in the next, I don't know, you know, six to 12 months when we already have a huge oversupply it's it's gonna change things you know it's really really gonna change things um, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens I just don't see people moving here this, at the same rate that they were moving here um, you know in the past couple of years if you think Miami Beach is having some challenges you got to see what's going on in the Tampa market the Tampa markets even is having even more challenges all right still on Ocean Drive let's uh, let's continue the conversation talking about the Tampa rental market. Now, Tampa is a, is a city or a metropolis very much similar to what's going on here in Miami. Miami, of course, is, um, is, is much larger uh, than Tampa. And Tampa really is a couple of small cities grouped together into a, one metropolitan area. Here's some interesting data on, on, um, on Tampa, and it's a little scary. So we're at about 75% of the units in Miami-Dade have been on the market for more than 90 days. Tampa's got 21,000 units, rental units, on the market right now. And they're at about a little bit more than 17,000. Uh, about 17,500 have been on the market at least 90 days. They're at 80% of the market, okay? That's scary. When you're between 80 and 85% of your market, your rental market is on for at least 90 days, that's scary. Now, I don't spend a lot of time in Tampa, so I can't uh, profess to to say that I'm an expert in the Tampa market. But when I look at these numbers, and then I look at all these other economists and housing economists that are absolute experts, and say that the west coast of Florida is really having some challenges, you gotta pay attention to what they're saying. It just doesn't look good at this time, and I think you're gonna have some tremendous opportunities to either buy some properties cheap, or if you're living there or you wanna go rent there, you're gonna have some tremendous opportunities to really name your price and go and live there. I'm gonna take a road trip up to Orlando this week and talk with a lot of realtors, so next week I'll have some more information, some, uh, some insight from all of these brokers in the Tampa area. All right, now why is this happening? Why does everybody say that this is happening? And there's some easy answers and some difficult answers. I think part of the reason that this is happening is obvious. You know, we've had a lot of storms that have come through Florida in the past couple of years. And instead of them taking the normal trajectory of hitting Miami and then maybe veering back off into the, uh, into the ocean, they have looped around or in between Cuba and Key West and looped around the West Coast and they have just obliterated some of these places on the West Coast. And when you get multiple towns that repeatedly are getting inundated by storms and major insurance claims, 
these insurance companies have just absolutely raised the premiums for these, not only the homeowners in, you know, in single family residences, but for the condos and the buildings as well. And all those costs, they all trickle down. Combine that with the fact that, you know, we had the Surfside Collapse a couple of years ago, and now the state of Florida rightfully has mandated that these buildings have to have reserves and they have to do their certifications. They can't wait for the building to, to be at the 40 year certification. They actually move the date. It's having this compounding effect, which is really creating a shock. It's, imagine ripping the Band-Aid off Instead of just peeling it off slowly, they ripped a Band-Aid off in the past year or two, and it's really starting to crush the market. And this is why we're seeing so many properties still listed for rent, and, and, and the price is really nosediving. Okay, now for like the, the part that's pretty hard to explain about what's going on in the housing market. By the way, Cleveland, they're behind me. It's, uh, we're coming up on football season. Usually Cleveland, they're on the weekends for football, college football, and NFL football. The Cleveland, there is a great spot to go and hang out. But what we see happening, I think, psychologically is that prices have gone up so much in the housing market over the past couple of years that people are finally saying, no, I'm not going to pay that price. I'm not going to pay this rental price. I know a two bedroom is not worth 4000 a month. I don't care how nice of a view of it has of downtown and Brickell. They're just not going to pay it. And I think also a lot of people that were coming here 2000, 2021, 2022, a good portion of them ha have had to go back either to New York or Boston, DC, Chicago, wherever that they were from. Um, you know, they got remanded or they, they were told you can't work remote anymore. You could work remote part of the time, but you had to be in the office another part of the time. And all of these factors are trickling down when you combine the insurance factor, the reserves factor, the 40 year certification, um, the lack of demand. And let's face it, a lot of people were flush with money during the quarantine and now we see you know credit card debt has spiked since 2021 i think credit card debt has spiked let me check this chart i, I saved this chart actually credit card debt went from about 750 billion in 2021 to 1.5 trillion so it went up i don't know it doubled this is crazy no other time in history have we seen credit card debt go up like this when you combine the fact that credit card debt has nearly doubled in the past two years the fact that maybe some jobs don't exist anymore AI has come in it's a perfect formula for like not actually creating the best market for people to go out and make enough money to be able to afford to live hey this is what we're doing here all in a day's work I don't know if you're a fan of Million Dollar Listing. I happen to love a Million Dollar Listing, especially LA. Um, the guys on the show are just great. Josh Altman, Tracy Tudor, Josh Flagg. The New York show was great too with Frederick Eklund and uh, Ryan Serhant and a bunch of other people. Ryan Serhant did so good with Million Dollar Listing that Netflix just said, hey, you're opening up your own, uh, your own company, your own brokerage called Serhant. Let's do a show with you. So it's the power of TV. It's the power of creating video content. It's proven right there. But the thing that I don't like, as somebody that's a professional in the business, is that it always seems to be something crazy going on and a lot of, I don't want to say lies, a lot of mistruths. So for example, on, the, uh, on, on one of the episodes on, the, on this season, which by the way is the 15th season of Million Dollar Listing LA, and I always like to talk about um, Million Dollar Listing LA because I model the show that I do kind of off of the success that Million Dollar Listing LA has enjoyed. So Million Dollar Listing LA, um, you know, it started out 2008. And if you watch the first two or three seasons, it was, it was done with a lot of small cameras and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, tricky editing. And the, the cast wasn't exactly the most engaging or camera ready. So that's my, my inspiration. When I see how they've done it, I know that I can do it. And that's why I'm so happy to see that the show got on Amazon Prime and Tubi and now a bunch of other places. One of the houses that Josh, uh, Josh Altman and his brother were selling this year was in the Truesdale Estates. Um, I believe it was on uh, Chalette Drive, okay? And the storyline goes that he had sold the house to clients. The guy was the number one Rolls Royce salesman in the world out of Chicago. And he buys a house for, I don't know, 17 million a couple of years ago. 
And then on the show, they create this storyline where maybe Josh Flagg is going to buy it, but his offer isn't good enough. And then they go to somebody else, and then, then the, the, the sellers come in, and they think they have a signed contract, and it's not real. And then at, at lunch, they negotiate through text message. <laughs> impossible. They negotiate a deal down from $17 million to $15.7 million. Now, this show was filmed, I don't know, in, in the last 12 months, okay? And the reality is, and this is why I don't understand why they do things like this, the reality is that, you know, I looked the house up, and here's what I saw. Yes, Josh Flagg did sell the house a couple of years ago to these clients. He did sell the house for $17 million. But then he listed it last March. So a year and a half ago, March of 2023, he listed the house for $22 million. And then it sold in August for $15 million. $15 million. Not $15.7. It sold for $15 million. And now it's back out in the market, believe it or not, for $19 million. And it's listed by Anthony Berla. And Debrilla is uh, an agent who kind of formed his own team from uh, New York and, and Los Angeles. But this is the thing. I don't get it on reality TV why they go and they insist on doing this all the time where you can just go track what's going on with these listings and you can see that the reality is they're full of shit. This isn't what the house sold for. Not only that, but you didn't sell the house. So it just makes, it's, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling. So when you're watching this, do a little research. Everything's publicly available. Just go look at it, pay attention. Go search it on your phone while you're watching the show. You'll never see that on Caravan because we just show the house. Say, here's who lists it. Here's how much they're, they're asking for it. And then we really don't do a follow up on it. We just like to take you behind the velvet rope on Caravan TV. How you doing? Good seeing you. Now let's discuss the final topic. What's going on? in the world of politics and the economy. You know, it's interesting because um, Kamala came out this week and she kind of unveiled a little bit of her, I don't even know what you can call it, but she wants to spend 1.8 trillion on, on free giveaways. She wants to cap the, the, the price of food, basically price control food, which is a little crazy. Um, very interesting to see what's going on, but even more importantly, forget about, forget about that. We got this huge, uh, the, the DNC is happening in Chicago. Now, last time the DNC was in Chicago, uh, with, with this kind of political weight around it, was back in 1968. And that was during a time of major upheaval. Not only that, but it was probably during a time when the, the CIA really kind of was infiltrating American culture for the first time, and nobody ever realized it. The difference is this time, everybody knows that the CIA and counteroperatives, that they're all like inside of the, 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 the government, they're all inside of society, they're all inside of the media, and the same ways that we've tried to go and control the media in other countries for years, we're now doing it inside of our own country. We've been doing it for years, but now we're actually, like, people are actually seeing it and see what's going on. It's going to be crazy what's, what's going to happen. Apparently there's 100,000 anti-Israel protesters that are going to show up. This should really, really be interesting. Um, and I just hope that, it, uh, that it's peaceful and that it's nothing crazy. And that uh, at the end of the day, of course, we all want Trump to win, you know? But we'll see. Time will tell. <sighs> nice little walk on Ocean Drive again. It's been a little different this week. I kind of sat and, and, and picked a couple of spots to just stand and, and set up the, the little mini tripod and, and do little segments from little spots. But it, again, a lot of interesting things are happening, not only inside of uh, politics, but inside the business world. Um, I said it last week, I said it two weeks ago. These people that came out and said, oh, it's amazing how dark it gets once you're underneath the, the tents. But these people that said a couple of weeks ago when we had the, the mini crash in the market, where all three markets went down a thousand points in a day, you know, uh, I, I said that all these people were going to look like idiots because this is what the market does. And sure as shit, what do we see? We see that the market has absolutely recuperated in a strong way. But you can't look at the stock market as a really valid indicator of what exactly is going on. Because not everybody's invested in the stock market. I like to look at the price of you know, mangoes action. Gotta love mangoes. It's always a good time. I think I might go in there and get a beer. Um, you, can't, you can't really look at what's going on 
in the stock market because not everybody's invested in the stock market. I think what you need to look at for a more accurate, I don't want to say depiction, but I think what you need to look at for a more accurate snapshot of where we are economically is look at the price of gas. Thank you. Look at the price of gas. Look at the price of bread. Look at the price of eggs. Um, you know, and that's going to tell you more so what's going on in the economy than anything that you see in, uh, in the stock market. Because everybody's buying bread. Everybody's putting gas in their car. Everybody's going out and um, everybody's got to go out and get, you know, the essentials for the house. You know, so that's, uh, that's where I see the, the true gauge of where we are economically in the world. Well, it's been another fantastic time sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you for listening. Make sure that you um, copy, share this on your wall. Um, you know, Ronnie G ain't doing this just to, hey, how you doing? You look good. Yeah, wow, I think I might have just found a wife. I don't know, she was hot. But, um, but you know, uh, I don't do this for my health. I do this to share my knowledge. I do this to help promote the, uh, the podcast. Oh! I even forgot. So we are doing a documentary called The Sixth Borough, and it's going to document the stories of about 20 people that have moved from the New York area down to Miami uh, over the past, you know, five or 10 years. So if you are a New Yorker that has moved down to Miami um, or somebody from the New York area has moved down to Miami full time and you want to be on this documentary for Tubi, make sure you reach out to me. We'll get you on there. And then... Uh, that's it, baby. I'm Ronnie G. This is Caravan, the podcast. You'll have a fantastic week. Send this to a couple of uh, friends if they're in the, uh, in the business and uh, let them know what's going on. See you next week.